Amen. Please now remain standing, and we'll be reading together from the book of Jeremiah, our sermon text, Jeremiah chapter 33, we'll be reading verses 14 through 26. This is found on page 787 in the Bibles in front of you. This is God's Word. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, and the Levitical priests shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices forever. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that day and night will not come at their appointed time, then also my covenant with David, my servant, may be broken so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne and my covenant with the Levitical priests, my ministers. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered and the sands of the sea cannot be measured, So I will multiply the offspring of David, my servant, and the Levitical priests who minister to me. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Have you not observed that these people are saying the Lord has rejected the two clans that he chose? Thus they have despised my people so that they are no longer a nation in their sight. Thus says the Lord, if I have not established my covenant with day and night and the fixed order of heaven and earth, Then I will reject the offspring of Jacob and David, my servant, and will not choose one of his offspring to rule over the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For I will restore their fortunes and will have mercy on them. Thus far, the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. For your faithful word. And thank you that when you commit yourself to something, you never go back. You are always true to your commitments. And so, Lord, this gives us the bedrock on which to found our lives. And, Lord, we want to know what you've committed yourself to. We want to know what we can really count on. And so we pray, give us attentive hearts and ears. Help us to know not only you, but also to know ourselves as we are in Jesus, and it's in His name we pray. Amen. Well, in everyday life, we tend to sort people into two groups. There's the VIPs, and then there's everybody else. So what's it like to be in the presence of a celebrity for most Americans? It's like there's this aura that surrounds them. And afterwards, we're like, oh man, I can't believe I got to meet so-and-so, whoever. Same thing if we ever meet a high-up political leader that we respect or anybody who is the VIP. Um, Even as a pastor, I often hear, you're special. You're more holy than me because you're the pastor. That's the VIP mentality, right? Right? So that's something we have all across the board in America, a very common idea that penetrates us here in the church. And then there's the Bible. And the Bible views everyday Christians as having incredibly high dignity and worth. Everyday Christians are people of incredibly high dignity and worth, And yet, what's the irony of all this? We have all this dignity, and yet very often, even as Christians, very often we live our lives as if we personally are not that important, and we choose sin, we choose even things that maybe aren't sinful, but just sort of base and cheap and worthless, and one of the things we often say that justifies this is, well, what's the point? My life, my life, 
is not that important. After all, I'm not one of the VIPs. My life doesn't really count. Jeremiah has something to say about this. As he's talking about this age that is to come in the new covenant, he has this incredible passage God gave him that talks about the incredible glory that God's people will possess in the time that is to come, this time of the new covenant. So we're going to look at this glory, have it challenge our view of ourselves. We're going to see the glory that God says is ours. First, in this passage, seeing how God promises that glory, and then how Jesus brings that glory. And finally, we'll talk about what does it mean to live in the joyful certainty of the high dignity and glory and worth that each one of us has as Christians. Now, there's so much going on in this passage that I just can't step through uh, verse by verse and answer all the questions, bring out everything that I'd like to bring out um, in the time that's allotted to us. But I'm going to tackle this by talking about a pattern that appears a couple times here that's super important. This pattern is central to this text, and I'm going to call it the head-body pattern. The head-body pattern. The idea is this, and it's something we see throughout the Bible. The idea is that what's true of the head is also true of the body. The head-body pattern. And we see this in the first chapters of the Bible with Adam as the head of the human race. Here he is. He's made in God's image to rule the world. He's the head. But everybody he represents, all of his offspring, guess what? They're also made in God's image. And they also have the calling to rule the world on God's behalf. And when Adam, as our head, as our representative, when he sinned, what happened to everybody he represented? The whole human race shared that sinful identity. They all became guilty and corrupt. And we even see this just in kind of everyday life um, around us in various ways. It's not the exact analogy, but just I want you to see this is not some weird Bible concept. Um, you know, a football team, right before the game, the captain, he goes forward for the coin toss. What happens when he wins the toss? Well, his whole team benefits, right? His whole team benefits from the choice either to kick off or to receive. Or if you have a body of elected officials and they declare war against another nation and they have the authority to do that, then what happens? Well, these guys declaring war means now the whole nation is at war. So the things that the body that um, represents does reflects then on those they represent. We share in the identity of those who represent us. It's the head body pattern. And in Judah, in Jeremiah's day, think about what the head, the guys up atop, are doing. It's not good. The leaders have been leading the people down into sin. You have one exception in the kings with Josiah, who was a good king. But by and large, these kings, what are they doing? They're encouraging. They're actually leading the way into idolatry. The priests and the elders, same thing. They are on a beeline towards apostasy and idolatry, and they're leading everybody down into it. They should be encouraging holiness. Instead, they're bringing the people into sin. They're even opposing good truth speakers like Jeremiah and persecuting him when they should be embracing him. And so the terrible choices of Judah's leaders is now becoming true for the people as a whole. Indeed, the terrible choices of the leaders of the people is one of the key reasons God is sending all of the people away into exile. And that's where this passage comes in. This is after they've been sent away, and God now is speaking to them, saying, now hear what I have for you in the future. I am going to give you good leaders once again. And we saw this already before in chapter 23. This is now a couple months ago, but chapter 23 is this wonderful part where there's going to be this new and better king who's going to have this name. His name is going to be the Lord is our righteousness. He's going to be finally the decisively good king who loves and honors God. And then look what we have in our passage today. It picks up on that promise. 
Verses 14 and 15. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise that I made to Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch. In other words, here's the chopped down tree of the line of David. He's going to cause this righteous shoot to come out of that seemingly dead stump. And he's going to give that righteous branch, cause it to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Now, we're thinking to ourselves, yeah, but we already knew that from chapter 23, right? But then look at verse 16. Look at what he says next. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. So, as goes the leader in his righteousness, so goes the nation. They will dwell securely, and this is the name by which it will be called. And it's clear that it is referring to Jerusalem. This is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Now, if you're remembering that previous passage, you're like, hang on a second. Wait, that name for the city is the name that he gave to the righteous king. The righteous king is supposed to be called the Lord is our righteousness. And we should say, exactly. This is what we should expect. It's not like it has to be either or. No, as goes the leader, as goes the king, so goes the nation. So goes the city. When God sends the good king of the line of David, who's going to finally do justice and righteousness, what's going to happen? It's not just going to glorify and honor God for that one individual guy's part. It's going to bring glory and honor and righteousness to the people as well. It's the head body pattern, right? And the head body pattern continues. This is, I think, really exciting stuff in verses 17 and 18. What happens there? God says about the lines of David and of Levi that neither of them will lack a man to stand before him. In other words, to serve him. In other words, there will always be a king and a priest serving before God on their behalf. So David, he was the line of the king, the kings. He was the head of the line of kings. Levi is the head of the line of priests. But then he says this. We're thinking about that. We're like, okay, yeah, they'll, they'll, he'll never lack a man. There will always be one guy who will be of the line of David and the line of Levi. But then look what it says. Verse, 17, or verse 22. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, and the sands of the sea cannot be measured, so I will multiply the offspring of David my servant and the Levitical priests who minister to me. Do you get what he's saying? He's saying it's not just there's going to be one, one faithful son of David and one faithful son of Levi. There's going to be a myriad of them. There's going to be tons. In fact, as many as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And we're thinking to ourselves, hang on, I feel like I've heard that before. Abraham, right? Don't you remember how God promised Abraham that his offspring would be as numerous as the sand on the sea and the stars in the sky? He did. Well, you put those pieces together and you say, okay, that's how big Abraham's offspring is going to be. But now he's saying that's how big David and Levi's offspring are going to be. And you start to realize, hold on a second. He seems to be saying here that all of the children of Abraham will have these royal and priestly callings. They'll actually be priests and kings of God Most High. And again, it's as goes the head, so goes the body. As the head was called, the Lord is our righteousness, this loyal and faithful son of David who's going to reign and do what's right finally. Now, all those whom he represents that faithful priest, that faithful king who's at the top, all those whom he represents will share in his royal and priestly identity. And I hardly have to tell you how this comes to pass. You know, Jesus. Jesus is the head and we are the body. This is our second point. Jesus is, as you well know, the ultimate son of David. He is the obedient king who finally does what's right. We were just talking about this in Sunday school. Finally, he obeys all the way to the end 
and seeks the glory of God all the way to the end, even to the point of death on a cross. What's he doing? Finally, as opposed to Adam, who seized his kingship for his own power and exploited those, um, all the kings after Adam exploiting those whom they rule over, right? The, the kings of the earth lorded over those that they rule over. Finally, in Jesus, we have someone who instead of exploiting his subjects, gives his life for his subjects. And his resurrection from the dead, what is, it, what is that saying? Not just that he's alive again, but he ascends, he goes up, he takes the throne in heaven. Where is Jesus now? At the right hand of God the Father, reigning as king. And where, what, what's the throne he's sitting on? It is the throne of God. But guess what? It's also the throne of David. Because he is of the line of David. So he's the ultimate king. But here's the amazing thought, and this is the, the thing I'm, I'm wanting you to see from this passage. Jesus is the ultimate king, but guess what he does when he becomes king? He makes us co-rulers with him. Here are a few New Testament texts that show this. Ephesians 2.6, everyone who believes in Jesus, Ephesians 2.6 says, everyone who believes in Jesus becomes a co-ruler with Jesus, for God has raised us up with Christ and seated us with him with Jesus in the heavenly places. Where is Jesus? On the throne. Where are we? Seated with him. What does it mean where we are? On the throne with him. It's true even now. We're co-rulers with Jesus, but there's more to come. If we endure, 2 Timothy 2.12 says, and this is the last letter of Paul that's at least preserved for us. He's, he's enduring all the way to the end. He says, if we endure, we will reign with him. We will what? We will reign with him. Jesus in Revelation 3.21 says to this struggling lukewarm church, he says, to the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. It's a mind-blowing thought. One day, we will get to sit on the throne next to Jesus. In fact, God has already made us fellow heirs of the house of David. One day, we will rule the new creation with the great son of David, Jesus. But then there's this. So it's the head body pattern with regard to the kingship, but it's also true of the priesthood. There's the promise to Levi that his house would not lack a man, would be, but would be as numerous as the stars and the sand. And Jesus fulfills this promise too, but in a different way than the promise to David. In David's case, he actually is, he's of the line of David. In Jesus' case, Hebrews makes very clear that he is of the tribe of Judah. He's not of the line of Levi, at least as he's reckoned. He's actually of an even higher order, the order of Melchizedek, this higher priesthood. And God does, still faithful to Levi, what Levi's line pointed to, a holy and godly priest, Jesus now, the great high priest, does and brings. Levi's line offered shadowy sacrifices. Jesus offers the great sacrifice through his dying on the cross. It's the sacrifice both to end all sacrifices, all the shadowy ones, and guess what? It's the sacrifice to begin all sacrifices as well. Why? Because we who are in Christ share in his priestly identity, and we get to offer sacrifices too. That's what Romans 12.1 and First Peter 2.5 say, that we are offering our bodies not to take away sin. Jesus did that already. He, he said those, both of those passages say we are now offering our very bodies as living sacrifices to God. That means we are priests offering sacrifices for the glory of God. Of Jesus. We'll talk more about what that means in a moment. But I just want you to understand the head body pattern, the big idea. Here's Jesus, the great priest king. He's the righteous one who leads us. He's the one who does the great and final sacrifice for us. He brings us to God, but then he doesn't stop there. He turns and he gives us his identity. You get, when you are believing in Jesus Christ, you get what Jesus himself has. He's the ruler of the whole cosmos. But he doesn't say, it's mine, it's all mine. 
No, he, he becomes the ruler of the whole new creation, and he says, I want you to reign with me. He becomes the great high priest, leading us into the presence of God with his great and glorious sacrifice. He says, I want you to have this honor too. In fact, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 6, 3, that you, O Christian, will judge the angels. Why? Because we will be so clothed with power and authority when Jesus comes back and we're raised up together with him that Jesus, I mean, it's a mind-blowing thought. Jesus is, of course, the ruler of all the angels as well as everything else. Well, guess what? He makes us co-rulers with him, and that means one day we will even judge the angels with Jesus. Do you realize the identity that you have? Growing up, you may have sung in Sunday school. Maybe, maybe even people have sung this recently. The song, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Do you realize that is a profound song? Like very few of us here, maybe none, are biologically in some way tracing our lineage back to Abraham. What's it saying though? Father Abraham had many sons. I am one of them. How did that happen? Well, faith in Christ, the true son of Abraham, gives to you the identity of an heir of all of Abraham's promises. You are an heir of all of Abraham's promises. Well, now I'm going I'm to expand that. Galatians 3 tells us that's true of every believer. You are a child of Abraham, an heir of the promises. Now I'm going to expand it. I'm going to say, that you are not just an heir of Abraham's promises. You are an heir of the promises God made long ago, both to David and to Levi's line. Don't have time to go into those passages, but in both cases, God made special promises that they would be king and priest. You receive what was promised to them. You are a child of David. You are in the line of Levi in the same sense that Jesus gives us the permanent priesthood, the permanent kingship. You receive those things because Jesus has them. You become fellow heirs with him. Why? It's the head body pattern. He's the head. You're the body. You're one with him. And that means you share his holy and beautiful identity. Jesus says, I want you to be kings and priests with me. So, what does this mean for us? How do we live this? I mean, this is amazing stuff. Here we were, we used to be corrupt. We used to be under God's anger. I mean, what, what God did with Adam, he was totally right to do. Sending him out of the garden. Why? Because he was a bad king. He seized authority for himself that was not his. He seized it for his own selfish ends instead of ruling for God. Likewise, he was a bad priest. He didn't protect God's garden sanctuary when this foul creature, the serpent, entered and defied God. God was right to remove Adam, and he was right to be angry with us because we have not been good rulers of God's world. We have not offered good sacrifices to God. We have offered ourselves to all manner of idols and defiled our hearts. Well, what, what is Jesus doing on the cross? He's taking that failure to be priestly, kingly people away. He's washing us clean. And not just washing us clean, He's reinstating us in our holy, kingly, priestly identities. We are now in Christ remade to do what we were always meant to do. In other words, in Christ, God is fulfilled Jeremiah 33. So how do we live this? How do we live out our kingly, priestly identity? And before I answer this, I want to deal with what may be an objection you, you're thinking about, and it's this. Back in the 80s and 90s, um, it was this fad to tell every kid that they're special. It's like, we've got to help these guys with their self-esteem. We've got to tell everybody they're special. <laughs> well, uh, there's just one problem. If everybody's special, nobody's special, <laughs> right? Like, it becomes this empty term, right? So does that, is that sort of what's going on here? Like, is he just saying you're all special? There's no VIPs? 
Well, it's important that we understand what's going on here. Like, when Jesus elevates us and says, you are a king with me, you are a priest with me, he, there's still a distinction. He's still the head, and we are the body. Anything that we have, we have in him, and we have in submission to him. He remains the high king. But the point is this. When Jesus elevates us out of the filth, and he sets us with him, he's elevating us to a high calling that we all share that we all have. It's true for every one of us. And this is the first point of application, that this high and noble identity is true for everyone who is a Christian, no exception. So, no one in the church is allowed to say, oh, you're holy, I am not. No, you're all made holy through Jesus Christ. Of course, there's still distinctions in the body. Whether you're male or female means there's going to be different roles that you'll have. Or if you're an officer in the church, you have certain privileges and also certain duties that other Christians do not have. And then there's a distinction between mature and immature believers, where the mature are enjoined to disciple and encourage and mentor the younger ones. So there are these distinctions. But the point is this. If you are in Christ, every one of us, no matter those things, male, female, mature, immature, whatever, every single one of us has an incredibly high identity, no matter those other things. And so we can't, we're not allowed to think too little of ourselves. We're not allowed when God has given us this incredibly high role of priests and kings We're not allowed to think lowly of ourselves. And we're also not allowed to think too highly of ourselves relative to other people. Like no pride allowed. Let's just remember, we receive all these things by grace. Right? And everybody has these honors. No exception. Everyone who's in the church. So every Christian has it. Second point, this. This high and glorious calling that we all have. What is it? Luther called it the priesthood of all believers. I hope you see now Jeremiah 33 is just tweaking this slightly. And he's saying it's not just the priesthood, it's the kingship of all believers. Right? We are all sharers of this high calling. Even what we read from Revelation 1, um, a kingdom of priests. 1 Peter 2, a royal nation, a holy priesthood. Well, if this is true, then we need to start living this as if we actually are possessors of this noble identity. I'm going to tweak slightly a C.S. Lewis quote. It's a very famous one, but it's just so good. And it really gets to the rub of what I'm trying to challenge us on here. He says, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and relationships and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum when he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a vacation at the beach. We are far too easily pleased. Look at your life. Are you dinkering around with base things that do not befit royalty? Now, these could be like sinful things, illicit, forbidden pleasures that we just need to know. Not fitting at all. But they could also be things that aren't necessarily inherently wrong, but they're just cheap. They're vulgar. They're base. They're kids' play when we are made for so much more. Our culture, let's just be honest about this, our culture celebrates childishness. It says, oh yeah, be a kid as long as you possibly can. But do you realize we were made for dignity? We were made for glory. Not that we should all go around with our noses in the air and say, you know, sniffing down like, only highbrow does for me, thank you. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, are you seeking that which is commensurate of a child of the king, of someone who is actually a co-ruler and a co-priest with Jesus? Is what you are filling your mind with and your time with befitting and making you a better priest king in the service of Jesus? What are the foolish, childish things that you need to abandon and need to discard so that you can embrace the dignity 
of your new identity. Don't cheapen yourself. Know who you are. You are a, you are a priest king of God Most High. And know this too, that the way that priest kings show their priestly and kingly glory is through love. Remember Jesus, he showed his kingly and priestly glory through love. He didn't shun, you know, the, the dirtiest task if it was for the sake of love. Like he, he would wash his disciples' feet, right? That's what it means to be a good priest king in the service of Jesus. That's how we show our glory too. Remember that the royal law in the book of James is the law of love of neighbor. This is what it means to be a king. This is what it means to be an, someone who's offering yourself to God. And now let's just look briefly at this glorious role that you and I have. You are a ruler in the Lord's service, and so He calls you to rule well the realms that He's given you. You are, many of you, entrusted with great realms. Your spouse, your children, your home, your job, your money, your time, your skills, your energy, you need to see those as realms entrusted to you on God's behalf, and you now as a co-ruler for God need to rule those realms well for Him. And when you do that, and when you offer those, those realms to God and love, and you love Him and love your neighbor in those realms, guess what? You're not only being a good king, you're also being a good priest. Because that's what it means to be a priest in this present age, is to give of ourselves, to offer our lives to God. God is pleased when we offer our lives in love. And so I'm just wanting to ask yourself, is this an active part of your Christian imagination? Like, do you think of yourself as a co-ruler and a co-priest in the kingdom of Jesus Christ? I mean, do you realize that everything in your life is either claimed, is both claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan? Satan says it's all his. God says it's all his. Whom will you offer yourself to? Who will you live for? There is no neutrality. So you may not feel glorious as you go through each day especially when you're doing a really dirty job. But I want to encourage you, you are glorious in Christ. You are one with Jesus, and that makes everything that you do magnificent when you do it for Him in genuine love. Finally this, what if you've not yet bowed the knee to Jesus and received this identity? What about you? Of course, the answer is Jesus. To look to Him, to ask Him, Lord, I have not been what you've called me to be as a human being. I have not offered myself to you. I've been offering myself to myself. Go to him. Ask him for forgiveness. He will not turn you away. He will reconstitute you as you were always made to be. Priestly kings who serve entirely by his grace. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the glorious calling you've given to us. Forgive us how we have, for how we have not lived in accordance with this high calling. And thank you, Lord, for the glorious promises of this passage that you say you will be true to no matter what. Our great God, we are so grateful for your faithfulness to the promises in Jesus, and we thank you that we now are numbered as heirs of these promises too. Lord, help us not to cheapen ourselves. Help us to live in the glory of what you've given. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.